Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 151, and it's another episode where I'm going to look at a specific year during the long 16th century. We've done episodes on 1527 and 1601 already. And this episode is going to be on drum roll 1580. I chose this year for a couple of reasons. First, there was a big earthquake. Some of the earliest performances of history plays. I've done other episodes about how the English saw their history and how history was becoming much more popular during this period. So yay, history. And it's also the year when the first appearance of the song Green Sleeves is recorded. So let's dive in, shall we? One note, you can get show notes for this episode at englandcast.com 1580. But first, I just want to tell you about TudorCon. Yes, TudorCon is still happening, sort of. Back in May, when things were still really up in the air, it seemed like a second wave of the virus might be coming. I decided to postpone the in-person TudorCon and move everyone's tickets to 2021. So I moved my reservation at the venue. I moved all the reservations of all the people who bought tickets, and I thought that was that. But I wanted to do something for people who had already signed up to come this year. So I thought I'd do a digital version with the same speakers who were lined up to talk. So as I was beginning to plan that, I thought, you know what? What the world needs right now is TudorCon. I mean, think about it. Politics are insane right now. There's a pandemic, which may be worse in October than it is now. What we all need is just to take a weekend, stay in our pajamas, meet new friends, enjoy Tudor entertainment, learn some Tudor stuff, and just chill out. At least that's what I need. (laughs) So the point is, I decided to open it up to a broader audience and make it available to everybody. So it's October 2nd to 4th, and it's all online. It's $29 for all three days, and it's going to start with this party on Friday night where we will have a virtual costume contest. Then there's going to be period entertainment, performances from Renaissance Fair performers across the country. Saturday and Sunday, all the talks are going to stream live starting at 11 a.m. Eastern, U.S. Eastern, so it's not too early for West Coasters. There will be talks from some of your favorite Tudor authors and historians, people like Tony Riches, Sarah Morris, the Tudor Travel Guide, and more. Saturday evening, we're going to do a Tudor cook-along. The fabulous Brigitte Webster from the Tudor and 17th Century Experience is making a cooking video that we're going to follow along with. We can all share our creations in the group and see how it turned out for everybody. And then Sunday, we're going to have more talks all day with more performances and entertainment thrown in. So seriously, this is what we all need right now. We need to focus on things that matter in life, like friendships with people you don't even know are your new best friends, and learning about things that make us happy. So go to englandcast.com slash TudorCon2020 to sign up and reserve your spot. englandcast.com slash TudorCon2020. Okay, done with that. Let's talk about 1580. But seriously, come to TudorCon. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) All right. At the start of the new decade in England, Relations between Catholics and Protestants are deteriorating quickly. In 1579, the English College for Training English Catholic Priests was founded in Rome. The Age of Discovery was heating up. 1579 saw Drake claim New Albion, the Pacific coast of America, for England. 1579 was also the year that the Eastland Company was chartered to trade with Scandinavia and the Baltic Sea states. But Christmas and New Year 1579 to 1580 were spent feasting and enjoying the holidays as any other year. That year, Elizabeth received some lovely edible gifts at New Year. Among her goodies were 18 caged larks and quince pie that she was given by John Dudley, her sergeant of the pastry. She also received a satin nightgown from Francis Walsingham that year. Over the holidays, they watched plays like on January 1st, when the Four Sons of Fabius was performed by the Earl of Warwick's men. 
On the 12th, Elizabeth would enjoy watching tumblers from Lord Strange's men. Elizabeth was now nearing 50, and she was still playing the marriage game. In November of 1579, we had seen this preliminary marriage treaty with the French Duke of Alençon, her last serious contender for her hand. He was a Catholic, and she called him her frog, and nothing would come of it in the end. But on January 1st, the Spanish ambassador Mendoza wrote to Philip II that Edward Stafford, on a special embassy to France, arrived here, having been sent by Alençon with a letter to the Queen, in the sealing wax of which was embedded an emerald worth 400 crowns. Stafford said that Alençon would soon be here. Two persons of rank, however, would precede him. Alençon gave him a chain of a thousand crowns and as much more in jewels and buttons. The queen sent a post to Alençon on the night that Stafford arrived and told the latter to make ready for his speedy return to France. Can you imagine getting a letter with an emerald in the sealing wax? That would be such an awesome gift. The Spanish ambassador was none too happy when in mid-January that year he tried to corner Elizabeth about certain robberies that were happening on the high seas, and she apparently put him off, telling him to go enjoy the entertainments that had been provided for her. He says this was one of those which are customary here in which bears are baited by dogs. So we have some bear baiting going on. Not cool. One of Elizabeth's most famous quotes about not being a morning person comes from this year. On January 27th, the Earl of Hartford and Earl of Oxford were both at Whitehall. Hartford's journal said, At 11 o'clock in the morning, I went into the orchard where Her Majesty was walking with my Lord of Oxford. She sat down and then calling me, told me how she had ordered her counsel to report my cause to her and said, My Lord, you know I am no morning woman, but in the afternoon, tomorrow or the next day, I will be ready to hear and determine. So we have Elizabeth admitting that she needs afternoon meetings and not morning ones. February started off with a history play, Portio and Demorantes by the Earl of Sussex's men. History plays were becoming increasingly popular during this period. Thomas Legge wrote the first known history plays in England. In March, his Richard Tertius, written in Latin about Richard III, was acted by the students of St. John's College, Cambridge. It was possibly even seen by two university students in Cambridge at this time, Christopher Marlowe and Robert Green, who we've talked about in previous episodes. It would, of course, influence Shakespeare's Richard III 15 years later. This was a period when England was learning more about its history and separating out the myth from the truth. Old stories of Brutus were dying out, while there was a renewed interest in learning about the Vikings, Alfred the Great, and earlier periods in history. History plays would become increasingly popular throughout the Elizabethan period. In February, Lettuce Knowles went into confinement waiting for her child with Robert Dudley to be born. He had married her two years earlier in secret when he finally realized that Elizabeth I was never going to marry him, and the marriage had so enraged Elizabeth that she banished Robert's new wife from court. But this month, in 1580, Robert Dudley was caught up in some other court drama. For almost a decade, from 1568 until just before he married in 1578, he had a passionate love affair with Douglas Sheffield, though he never married her. In the 1560s, he wrote her an extraordinary letter. He said, You must think it is some marvelous cause, and toucheth my present state very near, that forceth me thus to be cause almost of the ruin of mine own house. My brother you see long married, and not like to have children, so it resteth so now in myself. And yet such occasions as there, as if I should marry, I am sure never to have the queen's favor. So he's basically saying he wasn't going to marry her because he would lose Elizabeth's favor. So then Douglas marries Sir Edward Stafford, the aforementioned Stafford who had been in France, and the two married in secret. There were a lot of secret weddings going on. In a deposition made in 1604, like 24 years later, going back talking about this marriage, Stafford told how on his return in February, he was summoned by the queen for an interview. She forced him to admit that he had married Douglas and then claimed to have 
evidence that Douglas was already married to the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, which would have made both her marriage to Stafford and Leicester's marriage to Lettuce bigamous. She tried to force him to importune his wife whether there were a contract between her and the Earl of Leicester, which, if it were, then she would make him make up her honor with a marriage or rot in the tower and would better the estate of Stafford. Douglas answered with great vows, grief, and passion that she had trusted the said Earl too much to have anything to show to constrain him to marry her. She had told Stafford the truth before she married him. In her own deposition of 1604, Douglas testified that she had married the Earl of Leicester, and their son, Robert Dudley, was his legitimate heir. But Douglas did have a child with Stafford, born in 1581, and Elizabeth was the godmother. So we have all of this court drama happening in 1580 in February 1580. February and March were filled with marriage negotiations for Elizabeth. Mendoza wrote back to Spain on the 10th in the morning whilst she was in her barge on the river, accompanied by two or three lords and ladies. She visited the French ambassador at his house and was talking with him for an hour in the presence of Alençon's gentlemen. On the same night, the ambassador hurriedly set off a courier. It was considered a great innovation for the queen to go to his house, and it is looked upon by some as a sure indication that the marriage will take place. This drama continued through March, but on April 6th, right in the middle of Easter week, things got shaken up literally. The Dover Straits earthquake made everyone incredibly nervous. Dr. John D. noted, Earthquake toward six in the afternoon. It lasted for two minutes. It began at exactly 10 minutes before six or thereabouts. Reports were that it killed two children in London. The entire country was fascinated and wanted news of the Easter earthquake. On the English coast, sections of the wall fell in Dover, and a landslip opened a new raw piece of the white cliffs. In London, half a dozen chimney stacks and a pinnacle on Westminster Abbey came down, and many Puritans blamed the emerging theater scene, which they saw as the work of the devil, as the cause of the earthquake. There was damage even inland. In Cambridgeshire, two stones fell from Ely Cathedral. And in Scotland, there was a local report of the earthquake, which was very disturbing to James, who was informed that it was the work of the devil. It had happened during Easter week, like I said, which was an omen-filled connection. James Yates wrote a poem about the earthquake. He says, Oh, sudden motion and shaking of the earth, no blustering blasts, the weather calm and mild. Good Lord, the sudden rareness of the thing. A sudden fear did bring to man and child the very thought, as well in field as town, the earth should sink and the houses fall down. Yeats's poem was printed in 1582 in The Castle of Courtesy. By June, it seemed as if the marriage to Alençon was off, except then Mendoza wrote back to Spain, June 11th, the negotiation for the Queen's marriage, which had been almost dropped, have again been revived. A council was held on the 5th, in which it was decided that the Queen should send word to Alençon that commissioners might come. They were unanimous in this. I was told that Alençon had written to the Queen that it was desirable to him that people should not think that the marriage negotiations had fallen through and he begged her to allow them to continue, which she did. That summer and early autumn would see big events with trade and exploration. Following a decline in trade with the Levant over a number of decades, several London merchants asked Queen Elizabeth in 1580 for a charter to guarantee exclusivity when trading in that region. So in 1580, a treaty was signed between England and the Ottoman Empire, giving English merchants trading rights similar to those enjoyed by French merchants. This was all part of Elizabeth's growing desire to have friendly relations with the Turks, since both of them seemed to be at odds with the Pope. Back in 1570, of course, Elizabeth was excommunicated by Pope Pius V. The papal bull said, Elizabeth, the pretended Queen of England, had seized on the kingdom and monstrously usurped the place of supreme head of church in all of England. She had left the said kingdom in a miserable and ruinous condition which was so lately reclaimed to the Catholic faith under Mary and Philip. 
So Elizabeth was officially cut off from the body of Christ, and Catholicism suddenly became even more suspect throughout England. The Bishop of Winchester wrote in 1566 that the Pope is more perilous enemy unto Christ than the Turk, and Popery more idolatrous than Turkery. This would actually be a point where the Elizabethans and the Ottomans could agree. They would often mention their shared dislike of idolatry, with both Muslims and Protestants disliking Popery. The bull encouraged Elizabeth to seek trading partners elsewhere outside of Christendom, and she had largely stayed out of the Holy League with the Battle of Lepanto. In March of 1577, Ottoman Abdul al-Malik captured the Moroccan city of Fez and proclaimed himself the Sultan of Morocco, and he wanted to do a deal with Elizabeth. Being desirous of the honor I hear of your Queen of England and the good liking I have of the English nation. He was going to offer access to the markets beyond Morocco, and this particular trading relationship angered the Catholics like none before it, as it dealt with the trade of arms and weapons. English tin was now going to the Muslim world, which would be made into weapons to be used against Catholic Spain. And then in September of 1580, Francis Drake came back from his journey around the world. Everyone thought he had obviously died, and yet his voyage was still alive, barely. Francis Drake's cousin, John, wrote, On reaching Plymouth, they inquired from some fishermen how was the queen and learned that she was in health, but there was much pestilence in Plymouth. So they did not land, but Captain Drake's wife and the mayor of the port came to see him on the ship. He dispatched a messenger to the queen, 60 leagues distant, appraising her of his arrival, and he wrote to other persons at court who informed him that he was in Her Majesty's bad graces because she had already heard by way of Peru and Spain of the robberies that he had committed. They also told him that the Spanish ambassador was there at court and that he was making a claim for whatever Francis Drake had taken. Thereupon, the latter left the port of Plymouth and the ship and, lying behind an island, waited until the queen sent him word that he was going to go to court and take her some of the samples of his labors and he was to fear nothing. That island is now known as Drake's Island. Also in September, big music news. A broadside ballad with the name of Greensleeves was registered at the London Stationer Company by Richard Jones as a new northern ditty of Ye Lady Greensleeves. It then appears in 1584 in a book, The Handful of Pleasant Delights, as a new courtly sonnet of the Lady Greensleeves to the new tune of Green Sleeves. So there's a long-held belief that Green Sleeves was composed by Henry VIII for Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was rejecting King Henry's attempts to seduce her, and this rejection is supposedly what the writer meant when he said that, Thou cast me off discourteously. cast me off discourteously And I have However, it wasn't written by Henry VIII because it is a piece based on Italian styles that didn't even reach England until after Henry's death. Another interpretation I've heard is that the Lady Greensleeves was promiscuous, perhaps even a prostitute. At that time, the word green had certain connotations, most notably the phrase a green gown which was reference to grass stains on a woman's dress from engaging in certain activities outdoors. So that is another interpretation of the words of green sleeves. Green sleeves was all my joy. Green sleeves was my delight. Another interpretation is that Lady Greensleeves was incorrectly assumed to be a woman of certain ill repute. Her discourteous rejection of the singer's advances is her saying, no, why would you think this of me just because I'm in a green dress? By the end of the 17th century, the tune was starting to be associated with a Christmas carol. And by the 19th century, almost every printed collection of Christmas carols included some version of the words and music together, most of them ending with the refrain, On Christmas Day in the Morning. 
One of the most popular of these is What Child Is This? written in 1865 by William Chatterton Dix. So 1580, big music year. By the end of 1580, Elizabeth's marriage negotiations were off. Drake was bringing his treasure to Whitehall to show it off to Elizabeth. On December 24th, Francis Drake's treasure brought to the tower. The Golden Hind was sailed from Plymouth to London and the remaining treasure placed in a vault beneath the jewel house in the tower. So there we go. Big year. Earthquakes. Marriage negotiations. Huge music news. Trade with the Ottomans. It's a big year in the 16th century. So I hope you enjoyed this. You can again get show notes at englandcast.com 1580. Remember to get your TudorCon tickets at englandcast.com slash TudorCon 2020. And I will see you online on October the 2nd. And let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco or join the free Tudor Learning Circle at tutorlearningcircle.com. It's a social network just for Tudor lovers. So thank you so much for listening. And I will be back in another couple of weeks. Bye bye. Greensleeves was all my joy, Greensleeves was my delight, Greensleeves was my heart of gold and wool and my love. February started off with a history play, Portia and Demorantes by the Earl of Sussex. My God. February started off with a history play, Portio and Demorantes by the Earl of Sussex, Sussex, Sussexes. Oh my God. Sussexes.